The most valuable commodity on earth today is data. How we make it, use it, move it, and protect it. My name's David McCall. Join me today for the QTS experience. Three, two, one. Jeremy Gilbertson, welcome to the QTS podcast. So I'm trying to figure out how I introduce you to our audience. We'll have, of course, all the links down below. But if I told them you were a tech data center guy, they'd look at you and say, no, I think you're a stump, stunt double for Sam Elliott. So like young <laughs> Sam Elliott. I wish I had his voice. <laughs> That's right. He's... <laughs> Um, so couldn't, couldn't, they wouldn't believe me there. They would believe that you're a musician. What they might not know is that you're also an author and a writer. I'll just call you my friend and Renaissance man. Welcome to the show. Man, excited to be here and so excited to see you again. It's been years and uh, it's was, been, been a while. My, somebody said to me a long time ago, I was having a hard day. I, my wife and I were married 11 or 12 years before we had our first kid. So we just hit 34 years the other day. Congrats. Thank you. Unbelievable. Sometimes we just look at each other and scratch our head, and we don't know if we were really that committed to our relationship or just too lazy to do something <laughs> about it. But I'm uh, sure it's the, the first one. Yeah. <laughs> I just think it's, you know, um, ebb and flow, but I, I love her to death. And I better say that because she's half Japanese, half Irish, and she'll come at me and cut me. I'm afraid of that little lady. So, Powerhouse. Yeah, yeah. She, she's, uh, she's pretty cool. But anyway... Um, we had at one time, my daughters are approximately two years apart. So I have three girls, uh, now 22, 20, and 18. So okay. we're full on in the culture wars and uh, high school graduation right now, and one in college, and one who's wanting to work and see the world, which we, we dig all those things. But they were probably one, three, and five. And I'm a guy at that time in my mid thirties wondering what is going on. And my dad said to me, you know what? These days are long, but the years will be short. And he was so true. I irritated my 18 year old this morning who graduates here shortly. And um, she was telling me she didn't have to get up to go to school today because she's an honor grad. She doesn't have to take certain courses right oh, yeah. now. Yeah. And um, I don't know, it's probably six o'clock this morning. I came in next to her in her room and just gave her a big hug. You know, dad kind of teary eyed, like, it's my little girl and I love you. And she's like, get off of me. Yep. You know, what are you doing? But it's true. And so you reminded me of that when you said, man, it's been a while. It's mm -hmm. just, it seems like I blinked my eyes so many times. And the, the, in the day, the days are pretty busy, but you look up and a season's gone by, or sometimes many seasons. Fast. Yeah. yeah, unbelievable. Have you experienced that much? I tell you what, you know, the and we'll talk about this later, I think, too. But, you know, time is is the one thing that you can't save, capture, store and use for later. Right. And it's the one resource that actually moves in real time. Right. right. Um, and it's it's so <clears throat> especially when you have kids. Right. Um, and I'm in the same same boat. I mean, my my oldest is a. Um, Sophomore in high school, and I've got four going all the way down to seven. <laughs> uh, so I, we're in similar worlds. Yeah. You're just farther down yeah, the track than I am. But the whole time with the kids thing, I, I've always told myself, no matter how tired I was, no matter if I was feeling bad or just didn't feel like doing anything, if one of my kids comes up to me and says, hey, let's go kick the ball or let's right. go do this, it's like if I'm half napping, I'm up and we're right. doing and because I know just – by hearing stories and yeah. actually starting to see it, because my daughter's halfway through high school. Yeah, um, it's powerful stuff, man. Yeah, it is, and it's um, you know, I just saw my nephew with his wife and their five children. He's thirty-one years old, and they're coming through here on their way to Montana. They're relocating from Texas to Montana. Got a good gig up there, and they've always wanted to have that adventure. And good on them. But I was checking in on him, right? I was coming to the studio today. You know, where are you at? We're at this part of the country. And we were reminiscing, um, you know, when they lived in California, we had, I'd gotten out of um, the military and ended up in Texas, and they moved to be near us when they were young. His uh, mom is my sister. Hmm. And it was, it just feels like yesterday. He was, he said, I remember it, Uncle David, you know, I was nine years old. and. He was calling out things that I kind of forgot, but that were sparkling gems of his life that involved me. Mm. 
And if I hadn't gotten up and gotten off the couch, if I had, you know, at, at the time, I just, you know, almost a hassle to go do the go karts right. or to go move yep. furniture yep. or about throwing up on Thanksgiving, trying to play turkey bowl, you know, <laughs> 50 pounds overweight and out there with these little shenanigans running all around me. Or when we first started experimenting with computers and we would, um, I worked at UT, hmm. but in, um, in Galveston okay. and I was a IT guy for them. And so we would set up these big computer LAN parties in my garage and, all, you know, all the neighborhood kids and there would be 20, 30, my pastor would show up yep. just on how we could, uh, you know, game against each other. I don't really hardly remember them at all, but there's a generation of people that have these amazing stories for them, mm -hmm. and they want to pass that same emotion. It won't be with computer games in their garage, but it will be disc golf, or it will be fly fishing, or it will be, I don't know what it will be, you know, Minecraft, whatever it is, but these things where human beings come together and enjoy each other's company. You were a community builder back then, and you didn't even know it. Like, that experience is probably going to stay with someone that sat in your garage looking at computers and like you said, has been processed and extended yeah. in in a new way that they've shared with others, man. I think that's that's awesome. Yeah, well, I love people and most of the time, most of the time, <laughs> but that was pretty cool. So data center, so we met because we started in, or I, when I met you, we were both in this industry. Tell mm. us a little bit about your uh, background um, and uh, up to what you're well let's not get into what you're doing now because that's a really cool fun reveal but let's just start off with kind of your journey into tech yeah it's a, it's an interesting one and I think the through line that you you may pull out or your listeners may pull out eventually is like my my path has been pretty emergent mm. uh, rather than planned um, for for better or worse you know yeah. sometimes I look back and go yeah I probably could have built a little better framework to start, but um, uh, I'm super excited where I ended up. So yeah. um, I guess where I started, I was bartending at the time. Mm. Uh, right, as all great stories start. As all great stories start. <laughs> uh, was was having fun. I was playing music. I was playing in bands. I was doing some recording. <clears throat> and I was engaged at the time. I think I was you know 23. We got married when I was 24. Mm. And, uh, and I was sitting there and I had a couple of guys that used to come into the bar that were regulars. Mm. And just like any good bartender would do, you get to know your regulars. You know, if I see Dave coming down the stairs, I have Dave's drink ready to go before right. he gets to the bar and you know, we, we start talking. And anyway, um, one of the guys happened to be uh, the president of a company called Accutech. Mm. And Accutech was a structured cabling distributor. And you know, I think it was one night I was there, particularly like in this world of man, you know, I'm about to get married. I'm, you know, a couple weeks going to go sit down with my father in law and, you know, ask for her hand kind of thing, mm -hmm. expecting the, you know, man, are you going to be a bartender the rest of your life? Because that's, that's exactly what I would be asking right. whoever comes to chat with my daughter. But anyway, um, it was just timing and the, the president was like, hey, you know, when you're ready to get out of vampire hours, you know, give me a call. And he gave me his card and I tucked it in my car for, I don't know, a couple of weeks. And I was like, you know what? I'm scrubbing keg funk at like two in the morning. <laughs> I'm exhausted. I'm just like gross and, um, you know, just ready to kind of grow up a little bit. So I called him and he's, you know, went in, had an interview, sat down, no experience. I didn't even know what structured cabling was. Right. And uh, I sat down for an interview with, you know, this guy, Tom Baldwin, who is still one of my, you know, he was my first boss, great guy. Uh, I think he's over at Mayor Electric now, mm -hmm. still doing right. data, data center stuff. Um, but got the job. I walk in on my first day and, you know, my dad's like, good job, man. You know, you're doing the right thing. I'm feeling like I'm doing the right thing, I guess, because that's what I was right. you know, brought up to believe. And uh, they, they showed me my desk. You know, here's the computer, here's the phone, and here's a giant stack of leads. And uh, I'm like, okay. And uh, they're like, well, get on it. I'm like, okay. It was an inside sales game. Right. So I'm, you know, I'm a bartender. So I'm pounding the phones. I'm right. just, I'm just, hey, you know, Jeremy with Accutech here. You know, we we're a structured cabling distributor. We'd love to talk to someone about where you buy your products. And after getting my butt kicked for you know three or four hours, I had one guy say, all right, Jeremy, what do you got? Tell me about this structure cabling stuff. 
and I had my like boiler room moment. You remember boiler room where they're like, not the sketchy part about it, but like the part where the guy didn't know what to do and he calls Reco. Right. And like the senior guy comes in and closes the deal. Right. Because I had no idea what structured cabling right. was. And so uh, this, this woman who was my <clears throat> trainer came over, I handed her the phone, she closed the deal. And I was like, guys, you gotta show me what this stuff is all about. So right. we went to the network closet and pointed out the ladder rack and the patch panels right. and the switches and all of that. So anyway, long story short, I got into um, I got into it, had some success just by building relationships. And I'm like, you know what? I gotta learn this stuff enough to be of value to somebody when they call. So right. I wanted to learn how to design things and how to put systems together and what CCTV was and access control and AV and how all that integrated. And so then I became the guy that got sent to all the trainings and right. then became the guy that you know um, was doing design work for contractors and helping them put things together. So anyway, that, that was my entree into it, and then went more into the. Um, uh, I worked for Graybar for a bunch of years as kind of a network system specialist, right. business development guy. So had that role there, and then went to a data center design builder. That's where I really kind of fell into the, um, you know, the the design aspect, the program building, operational uh, programs, and right. that sort of thing. So right. yeah. I, um, as you were telling your story, I completely forgot about this. Uh, it's probably not on my resume. Uh, when I was 16 years old, a friend talked me into joining him at Olin Mills Direct, uh, where we'd go and we'd sit in a little boiler room. Do you remember Olin Mills Photography? Is that photography? pictures? Yeah, 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 okay, yeah, yeah. I was 16 years old, and uh, in Southern California, I would work between, in the spring and into the summer, I'd work on this Arab horse ranch as a like a groom and a uh, like a junior trainer, really just exercising the horses and stuff like that. That sounds fun. It was cool. We had a horse. We had an Arab ourselves, so it was a lot of fun. Free board. Um, I would do that in the um, spring and in the fall for them as they were preparing for whatever their season was. And in the um, winter, I'd work at the local ski area as a chairlift operator. This is Southern California, so not a bad gig. And in the summer, I would work at Six Flags Stroller Rental, story for another day. Oh my gosh. But I had a gap of about a month, and everybody had a few bucks. They were, they were working at the grocery stores or whatever, and hard gig to get in. Um, he said, man, I'm gonna go do this job over here at Olin Mills, you should come with me. What is it? I don't know, we're doing something on the phones. <laughs> and kind of similar thing, you know, you just they gave you, at my first probably 10 calls, I was terrified. Like, it's hard, oh, yeah, it's it was, hard to work it up, you know? Yeah. Once I did them, then it almost became a game between us. I didn't even care if they answered the phone, like I didn't expect anybody to say yes, I expected to get hung up on or whatever. And when I got, I don't remember how many calls it was, but when I got my first, well, that sounds interesting. Tell me more about your packages. You're like, what? What? <laughs> so I did that, and, um, and then all of a sudden, it wasn't about being my friend. It was, you know, I got like seven bucks a package or three bucks a package, yeah. whatever it was. I was like, well, if I can get 50 packages done? Now, this has been like 1981, something like that. Pretty good, bread. If I get 100 bucks in a week, that'd be like 1,000 bucks a week now. Like there was, mm -hmm. everything cost less. I was living at home, yep. uh, sophomore in high school or junior in high school, something like that. And, uh, but that was my first taste of, um, you know, inside kind of gig and connecting with people. And then as soon as I connected that first time, I really wanted to connect again. Like that was a high for me, like, wow. Mm -hmm. Uh, you know, and this would be a great package. Unfortunately, I found out later it's pretty much a scam. Uh, they didn't, you know, when they came in for their portraits, they upsold them and it was never what they went. But I went in completely naive and it was just an amazing time. It's interesting. It reminds me of a, a gig I had in college that was very short lived. It was for a company called Dial America. Mm -hmm. And it was very similar, but like, I was I was literally in a bullpen of like a hundred other college kids. We all had headsets on, and it was auto dialers, mm. so you couldn't escape. Right, like once you couldn't like because you know when you you make your first call, you're like, oh, you pick up the phone, you like reluctantly dial before you get your sea legs about you for the right. day, right? And this, you put the headset on, it automatically ring. You're like, oh my god, I'm and I'm like right in the fray already. Right. Um, I was, I mean, it was the dinner. My shift was 5.30 to 7.30. So calling people at dinner time, yeah. trying to sell them children's books, man, I got my butt kicked. Right. Like it was, but, you know, to your point, <clears throat> a lot of times, and this is unfortunate, I think, in some ways, a lot of times you really have a very small window 
to connect with somebody. Right. And getting your reps in that kind of world is not is not terrible, I don't think. Yeah. I think it's fantastic, especially in particular as I've gotten older, to do it in a, for lack of a better word, the good boiler po- room kind of way, right? Totally. I, I'm, I, uh, once you carry enough baggage accidentally, I don't need to be putting out into the universe on purpose uh, bad decisions or manipulating human beings or whatever. Mm-hmm. Um, so it can, it's almost like social media. It can engender the best of behavior. It can engender the worst of behavior or, or, um, empower it, right? Oh, Mm -hmm. look, I've got, I can exert this and my, my kids have experienced this, um, usually against them. Um, something doesn't have to be true. You don't even have to be part of the platform. If something is said about you or a group of people or, you know, whatever, enough of that audience without fact checking will believe it to be true and now you got to unwind it and Mm -hmm. and um that was an early taste for me of i didn't fact check the back end and i'm not trying to just you know uh besmirk the company that i worked for but i do remember when people coming in and a couple of them i you know i was eager to meet them and they're like you know this isn't exactly what we thought we were buying Mm -hmm. it's exactly what i my script said and exactly Mm -hmm. what i believed that i was putting it but i you know i was 16 years old i didn't fact check it or even know that but it was it really kind of planted a seed in my brain um later in particular as you know i felt it i felt the weight of it like man you need to not of that incident but a collection of incidents over time be truthful be mm-hmm. factual if you're yeah. persuading people use your powers for good right not evil yeah. um and when you recognize wow either i was short-sighted for the moment or accidentally it still caused harm recon you know um restore if it if it doesn't cause more harm restore and fix mm-hmm. but that was a that was a great early experience but i do think it's great for people to go through some kind of um, experience like that, or you were talking about being a bartender, and I'm really curious to to hear why that guy thought like, hmm, this guy's great at drinks. I should I should put him on the phone. Yeah. But um, to serve people, when you learn to serve people without trying to manipulate or control them, whether it's in the military or first responder or as in a service industry, my wife was a bartender working her way through college and a mm-hmm. waiter. I probably, I don't know that I was a bad tipper, but I didn't really think about it until I married somebody from the service industry. <laughs> God help my soul. We will go back there. Yep. Um, and if, if I didn't leave a good enough tip, we're driving back to take care of those people. Yeah, the, the restaurant industry, I tell you what, I learned, and I, I think I wrote about this in, in one of my early you know, self-discovery <clears throat> missions, but uh, the idea that like I learned more, I think, in restaurants than I may have getting my marketing degree in college. Mm-hmm. And a lot of people are, would look at that and be like, what are you talking about? And of course, I marketing degree, I, I learned some stuff about business. I learned some stuff about marketing, but nothing uh, immediately translated to me right off the bat but like working in a restaurant i i at the same time i was bartending i was also working in the kitchen so Mm -hmm. i would i would run the kitchen in the mornings and then bartend in the evenings Mm -hmm. and i tell you what man if you've run a kitchen line before or you've been three deep uh in the weeds as a bartender and you're having to like connect with people Mm -hmm. right and serve people but do it in a way that you can manage your own stress Mm -hmm to to make their experience better like learning that is power man yeah. and it's hard it's hard to do well you've got you've got a product that you've got to make in real time mm-hmm. you have employees that are that are on a spectrum of reliability mm-hmm. <laughs> um, and accuracy um, in real time and you have a customer sitting there expecting to receive a product either that they have a consistent experience from you before either the, and the product isn't just the food it's the right it's the experience from right. the door all the way through paying the check yep. all of those things and so you have all of this coming together um, and most of the people at least my experience was a lot of the people that are working in or managing those back then 80s and 90s were younger uh, people. There weren't mm-hmm. a lot of 60 year old man restaurant managers or mm-hmm. uh, bar managers. There might've been a few, but the majority of the worker bees and the, at least the midline management, what a better experience in how do I manage 
this environment. And by the way, um, I've heard it said, I don't have any experience or, or specific knowledge, just anecdotal information, that it's hard to make be profitable as a restaurant. Ooh, it is really hard. And yep. so you've got to not have waste, not have s- stuff stolen, not have disgruntled in every way and tab and trim this very dynamic yeah system that yeah it's uh yeah i spent my time in there and i thought about at one point me and my buddies were like yeah we're gonna we're gonna open our own bar and it's gonna be a music venue and all that i'm like no no that yeah the economic side of that but yeah hard so how did you so you got this introduction to um structure cabling and then later into uh, data centers, what was your first experience like really immersed into the data center world? Did you even know what a data center was before you did any of this? Uh, as I kind of went through the structure cabling awareness and this, all the systems that interconnect, I started becoming aware of, you know, all of this stuff has to land in a spot, right? Right. That, that can communicate with other spots right. and is controlled so it doesn't overheat uh, right. over time i learned that and by the time i was at i worked for a company called lee technologies oh yeah uh for a bit and you know that was really great experience because we had an awesome engineering team <clears throat> that um i brought my technology expertise to them where i didn't have much on the i, I had awareness on the mechanical and electrical side mm-hmm. uh, but i learned a lot about that piece of the puzzle there mm-hmm. um so helping organizations you know, capacity plan, do the technology stuff on the front end to help them figure out how big, how much, um, you know, how robust, and then kind of hand that program off to these brilliant engineers who would design all the systems and and make it all work. I had a guy work for me for, gosh, I want to say five years, um, became a really good friend of mine. His name was Randall Hyder. Did you know know Randall? Yeah. He was here for a while, wasn't he? He was. Yeah. yeah. He worked for me as an SE for a long time. He's over at Iron Mountain now, where he's a manager of solution engineers, just a, not only a genius, but just a great human being. I learned, I learned a lot from him and he was super kind of my naive nature on the MEP side because I was I would always bring him on to calls in the beginning where I'm trying to get connected with an organization yeah and he would jump on and kind of be the expert for me and he was yeah. great he's um Randall's one of the kindest a quiet geniuses you will ever meet our whole team loved him um uh, when he when he left for a much better opportunity, I mean, he loved it here. He loved our culture. It made me cry. We went to breakfast. The two of us cried like babies. Mm-hmm. I'm unashamed to say. Um, but yeah, he's over at Iron Mountain. Um, but Randall talked about Lee Tech at least at his time there before. I think Schneider bought them mm-hmm. or or something. He said, "Man, it was uh, it was very entrepreneurial, but it was a lot of fun. There was mm-hmm. a lot of stuff they were trying to figure out." And, um, and your leadership there was really pretty world-class, mm-hmm. at least his experience. Was that your experience with them? It was, it was really, really fun. We were in, in some respects kind of building the airplane a little bit as yeah. we were taking <laughs> yeah. off, but that's great because you know they came from a product rep perspective and then a lot of these clients started asking them, can you guys just help design this? Could you build this? Hey, could you right. operate this? And um, I worked for a guy, another Tom, uh, Tom Mertz. Yeah. Yeah. Um, Tom, Tom was with us for a little while, but about a year, year and a half. I worked with Tom. Yeah. 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 So Tom, Tom was great. He, um, he, he was really good at, uh, letting all of us do our thing because we had to wear a lot of different hats to make some of these deals come together. Right. And he would basically run block for us, right. you know, uh, on the top side, but yeah, it was very entrepreneurial. It was very like, Hey, I've got this crazy idea. You know, these guys want to do X, Y, Z. Can we pull it off? They're like, yes. And then of course, the technical team having the backup of a great technical team yeah. is so great um, to to have them come and execute. So right. you always felt like, as of not in the Olin Mills right. scenario, when I'm talking to somebody and I bring in the solution, then it's like, hey, they deliver. And right. It's really fun. Yeah. Right. Um, so f- thinking about that era then, and you went from Lee Tech to um, I went a from Lee build? Tech to EDI. EDI. Mm-hmm. Okay. And how long were you in that world between those two? Man, I I would say if you've maybe, got some kind of rep you need to keep up, you don't have to give us the exact. No, 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 no. I think I was at I was at Lee Tech maybe five years something okay. like that. I would have to look at the dates, and then I was at EDI for 
Uh, six or seven at least, okay. I think. So you started um, in the data center business when you were 22, 23. Pretty, uh, I'm teasing you because you look like you're 30 right now. So I'm yeah. just trying to adjust time frames well, in I'm my trying, head. I'm trying to keep the facial hair down because that's where all the gray <laughs> comes out. So um, yeah. as I as I know well, I've been it, I've been in it for a minute and I'm still definitely tangentially connected to that yeah. world. I'm still doing some projects there. Yeah, I um. When I got introduced, really introduced, so we had a data center at the University of Texas where I worked at, the um, campus that I worked at down on Galveston Island. <clears throat> and when I fully, uh, got fully immersed into the data center world, the idea of a 300,000 square foot data center was just, you know. You didn't even think of, it wasn't even mind blowing because you didn't even think of something that yeah, big. It yeah, it just, it was, um, <clears throat> it, it was just hard to, it's like, it's like going to Star Wars for the very first time, <laughs> and you're seeing the CGI on the film and or on the screen, and the and the you know that experience of the of the ships coming over your head and the new surround sound. And I I try to explain to my children, and they're just they, they grew up in a world that's so different than that. I maybe maybe uh, augmented reality or virtual reality will be for them mm -hmm. what this experience was for me. Two big movies I remember, two big experiences I remember. One was. Star Wars, and the other, um, not dissimilar, was Jaws. Oh yeah. And so, as a kid, there for me, there was nothing in the world like that. And I remember my uh, grandparents. We were out in um, the Bay Area, where my uh, parents are from, and it was the big thing. And I didn't even know the hype. I didn't, you know, as a uh, whatever I was, eleven or twelve year old, didn't didn't pay any attention to the hype or whatever. And we went to the movie. And I just remember being frozen for that first 15 minutes, like popcorn halfway to my mouth as, as you experience the battle and the stuff. And then here comes the, you know, Darth Vader on the screen. Like it just blew my mind. And not dissimilarly as a tech nerd, when I walked into my first re legitimate giant data center with an iris uh, scanner, you know, to, to just get into the facility and the, all the levels of security. And then you see hundreds of thousands of computers as far as the eye can see. And you know, man, I'm just in this one data hall. Like there's no way to equate that to anything. Yeah. What, what was it like? What's it been like for you kind of watching us go from these little bitty buildings to now there are many of them are millions of square feet. I think yeah, it's it's nuts. Like the the power and the you know network capabilities of some of these <clears throat> facilities that um, used to be, you know, this they used to be decentrally housed in companies' closets, right? Right, and you know, tucked away back. Maybe there was some dumpy little air conditioner in there or something. But to see. Uh, the need for that grow mm -hmm. in such a tremendous rate, and there's no there's no end in sight unless we figure out how to, you know, I, well the whole quantum computing thing is still really interesting to me, but that's a, probably a whole nother podcast discussion. Yeah. But just the the realm of it still going up is is because the insatiable appetite right. for immediate access to information, data, statistics, processing of that stuff, communicating of that stuff all across the country in near real time. I yeah. mean, you can't stop that train. Well, you can't, but it's not just because it's it's data, it's anything human beings. Generally speaking, we have this tendency. The more we experience something that we like that's addictive, food, um, intimacy, our at whatever, um, the more we want, the more we want, the more we make the more we make, the cheaper, more accessible it gets, the more we use, the more we use, the more we want. And it's just this. What is that, Jevons Paradox, right? Uh, I don't know whose yeah. it is, but it's, um, I heard it from uh, my old CTO, um, probably less elegantly than that paradox, but it was, it's that crazy idea. And that's why buffets do so well. That's why, Pornography has exploded. When human beings get introduced to variety and availability, I remember when they were talking about YouTube, and I thought, what? Mm. Who will who will watch this? Like, what would you upload? Like, that makes no sense to me. Right. Uh, the other day, I watched, um, or at the beginning of the pandemic, I watched 
uh, Robbie Robertson and Ringo Starr do this collaboration with a couple dozen other um, artists. Have you seen this video they made of the weight? Oh, it's the around the world thing. What change around the world yes. or something? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I know exactly what you're talking about. Playing for change. Playing for change. Yeah. Six hours later. So I watched that. Right. <laughs> and I started making notes of all the different. Oh, who's that? Who's that? Ooh, she sounds fantastic. What mm. instrument is that? Mm. Is that? How old is Ringo Starr? Like, is that really right? We playing? That guy's from South Carolina? Who's that guy? Six hours later, 20 artists and factoids checked later. And I look up, and it's the sun's starting to come down. And 100, I had, 100 dopamine hits later, right? Yeah. <laughs> right. Um, and so uh, whether it's the sport I'm into or the politics, actually, I'm pretty much sworn off of politics after the last five or six months. I just can't take that bruising anymore. The um, f fill in the blank. Uh, my wife and I are looking at each, or each other. We just got our boat out, spending some time in the boat. And we're, we're hooked, connecting with some friends that are looking almost as fit as you are. And we're like, what did you guys do in the last year? Well, you know what? We connected with a personal trainer. Oh, that's got to be a fortune. Actually, it wasn't. It was very affordable and very modest. Here's what we did. We changed. We're eating pretty much keto. And now and, um, oh, that sounds too restrictive. Well, here's how it's – in other words, no. here's how it's changed our lives. So what do we do? We run to YouTube to look up all the different – how do you do that? What does that look like? Um, and we're realizing, back to your point earlier about time, um, not only is it – the commodity that most of us human beings don't really pay attention. I admire those cultures that teach their children from the youngest of age to value this, to think of it as investing your time. But the other thing is, um, um, and what you're spending it because you can't get it back, it truly is, even probably more than health, the thing that you just, once it's spent, you can never re, um, get it back. But we, because we feel like we here in the West, we have an abundance of time, we completely dismiss its value. And so that was, in this weird way, kind of a shakeup for us. Look at, they, they were thick a year ago. We're thick now. We don't need to be thick. This is all about personal decisions. There's no mm -hmm. health reason or whatever. It's just what we're doing with our time and how we're spending our time. Yeah. So I don't know how that connects to data centers, but it's this weird phenomenon. No, the, it, it's interesting. The, the data center side, I, I, have you ever read anything by Kevin Kelly? Mm -mm. Uh, he's the um, uh, editor, and I think he's called the Maverick at Wired Magazine. Basically, he he I think he started or was one of the first editors of Wired Magazine. All right. And he's got a great book. Uh, he's a bunch of bunch of great books, but I read one of his. It was like uh, the ten inevitable technical technology truths. I think is mm. something very similar to that. Um, and he talked about like, there is more content created. Like if we, if we set the clock today mm -hmm. and you and I got back together this exact same time tomorrow, 24 mm -hmm. hours later, there's more content created in that 24 hours than you and I, if, if we lock the door right. for the rest of our lives, watch that 24 hours of content, we couldn't make a dent in it. Right? That's right. So we started talking about things like that were going to be important in the next stage of the game is like filters, right? So how do you have, you have all of this information. How do you make sure as a user, you have a direct path to the stuff you care about right. and an immediate eject button to the stuff that you don't care about. And I think there are different variations of that happening today, but he talked about filtering, he talked about access, um, access over ownership, which is really right. interesting, which is like the U the Uber, the Airbnb stuff. Right. So I don't know, um, there, there are a lot of uh, different things that comes out of his world from a tech trend perspective. That's fascinating because he, yeah. he's a guy who just zips back and looks at everything from like a 400,000 foot view and find the through lines. I mean, what's more fun than that, right? Uh, and as you're talking, uh, I've been, there have been a couple big threads as it relates to data centers, which is, right, they're just centers of data. And if you think about 50 years ago, what were the five wealthiest, most powerful companies on earth? They had a, they had a variety of commodities. You had Eastman, Kodak, you had IBM, you had um, Standard Oil. So you had, you had a range of organizations out there. A hundred years before that, it was uh, 
armor meat packing, AT and T, mm. um, probably some of the railroads. Also, still standard oil energy is always going to be up there. Old energy ideas, new energy ideas, but they're going to be part of that. Today, who are the five or ten wealthiest companies on earth? The first trillion dollar market cap companies. They're all data. Mm-hmm. Facebook, Amazon, Apple, Google, Microsoft, Alibaba, Tencent, right? Yep. They're, that, that's it. That's the commodity, not pictures or oil or meat packing or whatever. And so as you were having that conversation, or I've had this conversation off and on, <clears throat> um, one of them is the security around that. Mm-hmm. And when we're creating all of this data, there's this concept called data gravity. Are you familiar with data gravity? Not by that name, maybe. (laughs) Um, Data gravity or data tonnage, different kind of ideas around data. Data tonnage is all those bits and bytes have to live somewhere. Mm -hmm. They live on a hard drive. They live on a phone. They live on something. And so there's real physical weight to them. And we're housing, you know, um, we're in this, in my house, we're in this weird transition between kids that are in college nine months out of the year and then home for the summer. My daughter just came back. How she filled up her dorm room, I don't know. My truck's got stuff in it. My, my man cave's got her junk in it. My, mm. We're in a little house. We're not in one of these big 6,000 square foot houses. We're in a smaller, more modest house, which we thought, cool, kids will be out. Mortgage is paid for. You know, this is all filled with, she's an art major and a Korean minor. So we've just got this data, this stuff all over the place. Mm. So that's the idea of data tonnage. And then data gravity is <clears throat> when you have a little bit of data, you push it along, you push the packets along the fiber connections or whatever. But when data gets so big, it costs more money to push it Mm -hmm. to the app than it is that it then to pull the app. In other words, once it reaches like gravity, once it reaches sufficient mass, it pulls applications to it. You don't push the data to the apps. Mm -hmm. So we're dealing with these phenomenon. And then when that happens, the NSA said this will be the greatest decade for the transfer of wealth in the history of human beings because the value of the whole world is the data. Look what just happened the other day when the Colonial pipeline, pipeline stopped moving. They didn't have to steal anything. They don't mm-hmm. need to decrypt it or have quantum computer, you know, break the um, 256 encryption or right. whatever. Just stop it from moving. And if you stop it from moving, now what happens? Mm-hmm. The um, you know you can't fill your gas, or what if it's the electrical grid and you can't you can't? There's no storm; it's just not operating, so you can't get cash at the ATM or your prescriptions, or like on and on and on. And so, data centers, I think, have this role to play. Of not only are we the center of data, but how do we partner with, to make sure we have good connectivity? So we don't have any single points of failure. How do we make sure we have good physical security? How do we partner with the vendors to make sure that they have good logistical security from network attacks and just all of this stuff? So we've created this world of that. And then lastly, most of the world, whatever their motivation is, is talking about climate change and specifically how we consume energy. In fact, the only people that seem to be happy in the last few weeks were the Tesla people driving around me or the people in their Chevy Volts like, Got this charged up at home. Mm-hmm. You don't have an electric car? Sorry, right. bro. You know. Yep. And I love the idea of um, my one of my reasons for loving electric um, cars and electric vehicles is I don't have to have a gas station down the road. I can. Uh, I don't have to worry about a, a chemical spill. I don't have to worry about that kind of a, an event um, around us or or using property for that. Uh, I could just recharge at my house or whatever. So these are these these are the discussions. But data centers, because we're growing um, in our role, so whether they're little edge ones or the big massive ones, like we have the core data centers. Um, how do we do renewable energy? How are we good corporate citizens? How do we? Um, it's not just the power; it's water, right? Mm-hmm. How do we consume these resources in a? Um, in a, in a way that's great for our communities and for our shareholders. Did you guys work on any of that at all through Lead Tech or EDI? Was that part of your conversation yet? It seems like it's been an emphasis for the last four or five years. I don't know if it was even a decade ago. There's always, there's always a, um, I did a lot of uh, capacity planning 
uh, and program justification and feasibility, right? So I would work with, there's a large healthcare company that I worked with in, right outside of DC in Virginia mm. that, um, that basically <clears throat> had a couple of data centers, but they hadn't done anything to them in a while. And they were kind of hogs a little bit and not very efficient. And they had a lot of stuff in there, mm. a lot of data that was collected that is not useful. So helping them figure out how to say, what can we cut? What is useful to us? What is not? So tightening up on the front end from an IT perspective, from a corporate governance perspective, to make that document that you hand the smart MVP right. guys to design the systems, that that is where I lived in kind of the, not necessarily the, the obligation for, for the, for the you know, greater good of the environment, but it was also it was always something that you wanted to strive. Are we doing the right? Are we being good stewards right. of the energy that we're going to consume with that? That was always a part of it. Right. Yeah. It's um, uh, we we are scheduled to have a um, professor out of MIT come on here in a few weeks, uh, and Professor um, Sadaway, and they have. Um, He's been, he is part of the team. In fact, it's his lab that built out what they call liquid batteries. Mm. And so as when we talk about renewable energy, if you don't have energy storage, you really don't have renewable energy. You know, if you've got a, a data center that's, um, it's gonna sound crazy to say it, but 200 megawatts. Most of our hyperscale customers are asking us for gigameg campuses or greater. I remember when 20 megawatts for a data center was facility massive. was like, are you kidding me? It was massive. You yeah. will never use that. Now that's like the telco closet mm -hmm. is 20 megawatts. But anyway, um, so you have to have energy storage. What, and, and how do we do that without making a big lithium ion bomb or, or have massive fuel on standby? And so there's a lot of really cool, creative ways that they're doing this. Liquid batteries is one, mm. very inexpensive, very, very safe. And they can do grid level of capacity of many megawatts, hundreds of megawatts. Um, and there are other, air, hydro, um, that they're taking the concept of, uh, you know, you would push hydro up a, up a hill, essentially, to a reservoir when you had excess capacity on the grid. Mm. And when the sun goes down, they let the water come back down. Well, in order to do that, you have to have a big, giant reservoir, and you've mm. got it, you know, to turn the turbines. Well, now they're making, um, we've got somebody coming on soon from Energy Vault where they make these big towers. So they do environmentally, um, uh, I don't know if environmentally safe, but environmentally friendly, instead of just concrete, which can emit as much carbon in the creation of that, but they, they have this material that they build, these big giant blocks. And now it's in, like an erector set. Almost think mm -hmm. of like a giant wind turbine. When you have excess capacity, they stack the blocks. Mm -hmm. When you need capacity, they lower the blocks. Mm -hmm. And that turns a turbine, so now you don't have to push water and deal with evaporation, all of that up and down a hill. You do this. And there's so many other um, other energy storage ideas. And uh, the reason why I was asking about in the design build world, while our customers have always been interested, at least in the 17 years that I've been doing this, to one degree or the other interested in solar, or if they didn't have access to solar or hydro, natural gas, or something, something cleaner, what, what were the options? Um, to see the energy storage world exploding to take care of renewables is uh, phenomenal. I just are phenomenal. I didn't think I would see that, and uh, it's a really it's a, um, unexpected surprise. I just I just never saw that coming. I think it's wonderful the all the innovation that's happening in that space, yeah. and in the the ways we're solving this problem of, you know. <clears throat> super insatiably energy hungry applications, systems, um, data centers, all of that right. stuff. It's great. But I want to pull the thread back a little bit on some kind of first principle stuff. Right? Sure. So like, I think as as people and I, I this will this will come around uh, in, a, in a minute or two, but I did an experiment a while back uh, on minimalism. Mm -hmm. There's a whole trend on minimalism. I, I was thinking about this as you were talking about your daughter bringing back all of this stuff right. and, and all of that. So there was a challenge that I did uh, a few years ago. It was, it was called uh, the 30-Day Minimalist Challenge. And what you're tasked doing every day 
is you give one thing away. You either give it to Goodwill, you sell it, give it to a buddy. Day two, you give away two. Day three, you give away three. At the end of 30 days, you end up giving away like four or 500 things. Do these have to be inanimate? Because I've got a couple animate things that I might want to give away. That's an interesting. I don't know. I, I don't want to take you off your track. I think there needs to be a tangible nature to them. <laughs> uh, if you can, if you can capture and encapsulate them, yeah. I think we could call it a, a thing. All right, all right. Um, but anyway, it, what I learned about myself, and I'm definitely, you know, there's there's a whole um, host of people that are are challenged <laughs> with, um, you know, the, the hoarding phenomenon and right. all that. I mean, it's a real biological thing. Yeah. And I was I was giving away a few of these things and I had them set out in the garage and I walked back to go inside and I was like physically drawn back like I couldn't like I was physically drawn back to these things to reconsider keeping right. them and it was so powerful and I you know what if we applied that to how people are stewards of their data right um, in back in the past, we could we just kept everything because it was safer, right? Right. It was like, hey, let's just be real conservative and keep everything, knowing you know we probably won't even mess with a hundred terabytes of it, but right. or a hundred petabytes or whatever it right. is. Um, but I wonder how much of that <clears throat> flows from our biological nature to keep stuff just in case right. uh, into that world, and what sort of uh, benefit to the end. KW result or MW result, right. you know, would, would happen. So I don't know. Well, for sure. I mean, there's, you know, if you, one of the things that I got interested in this book, did you ever see, read the book or listen to the book Empire of the Summer Moon? Mm -mm. You need to write that down, check it out. You will love that book, Empire of the Summer Moon. You're going to be like, McCall, how are you going to bring this back around to talk about minimalism? It's a, it's, there are four stories going on at the same time, at least from my perspective. One is the story of Quanta Parker. Quanta Parker was the last chief of the Comanche. The second is a story of the Comanche, where they came from, a indistinguishable small people that in the 1400s or 1500s, they were up in Wyoming area, no different than any other pretty peaceful Plains Indian. Um, after the great horse outbreak out of New Mexico, um, the Spanish, thousands of horses got loose from the Spanish. Of all the peoples that got the horse, the Comanche were supernatural, literally supernatural. And until people got really this experience with them in particular, they drove the Apache. They drove the next closest, and it was a it's a distant second place where the Lakota Sioux mm -hmm. up in the Dakotas, mm -hmm. nobody was like the Comanche. The Comanche stopped the French, the Spanish, the Texans, and the Americans from expanding. A few hundred thousand people, 250,000 people maybe, over a territory that went from Colorado to East Texas to almost Mexico up to um, Oklahoma, Nebraska. You did not go into Comanche territory anybody indian settler it didn't matter they dominated that world and so how they so it's the story of quanta parker plains indians in general the comanche in particular and then the texas rangers and um there's no heroes there's no villains it's just a story Love and it. it's unbelievable but the comanche were minimalists spec they had no art they had no if um they were brutally efficient, but they weren't brutal people. Mm -hmm. So in the tribe, they were amazing. You, you either were if they if they um, did a raid and they caught Indian or um, white people, didn't matter. And you were within a certain age range in general. You were adopted into the tribe, full status. You're just in. Mm -hmm. If you're outside that range, younger or older, you're just exterminated. Mm -hmm period the way it was so they're very formulaic they're they're just minimalist but they weren't the only ones that was usually the try the the way that nomadic plains indians mm -hmm. were but the author tells a story in a beautiful elegant really interesting way but what it reminds me of is if you so because of that book i was looking at a lot of stuff on the plains and not just white people indians as well that settled in the area we were messy so you'd see these uh, settlements. It's easy today to say, well, look, it's just white European. Experience. It was everybody mm -hmm. except for these nomadic tribes. And we just spread out. Why? Because there were 
Because we could, we had limitless space. We had, yeah. um, you know, all these other things, kind of like we were talking about time before. So I think, um, and as restrictions got greater, as more population um, acquired, and we held each other accountable for how we took care of our aquifers and whatever over the next 200 years, that changed and consequences came. You had to pay for your space. Mm -hmm. I think in the same way with data. Data has been, you know, we just keep making platters, we keep, ma keep making silicon now, we're doing it in glass, we're doing 3D storage methodology and all this other stuff. But it's rapidly coming to the point where we can't store all that data. In fact, I wanna say it was GE, whoever makes the, um, I think it's GE makes uh, turbo jet engines mm. and they turned on the data collectors, the telemetry data, and that jet engine will make more data in a minute or three minutes. You don't have to wait 24 hours. Like what do we do with all of it? Mm -hmm. So back to your point about filters, like how do we filter it out to get the sample data that we need so the analytics can do its thing so that it can then program um, the data lakes so that the machines can teach each other so that the AI can make decisions. We probably don't need 24 hours of that data. And how do we then chew up and throw away the rest without storing it or causing a consequence to the environment or whatever? And nobody knows the answer to that yet, but that's what we're trying to do. So it's, in, it's interesting that you mentioned that and that book sounds fascinating. I'm definitely going to check it out. The, um, there's a biologist, um, uh, Wilson, I think is his name, E.O. E. Wilson, um, kind of a, a leading edge biologist back in the day, like in the you know early 1900s, mid 1900s kind of thing. He had a uh, something that he talked about being we had a wealth of information, a wealth of information, mm -hmm. but kind of a lack of wisdom, and what the world sure. needed was synthesizers hmm. and not like a Moog synthesizer that you play, but mm -hmm. like someone that takes that data, that information and turning it into something useful that, that can, can drive decision-making that can create new things. Mm -hmm. Right. So it's, it's kind of akin to what you're, what you're talking about is like taking all of this data, parsing it into useful pieces and parts that we can use to accelerate things rather than weigh us down. Right, and, and just not fill, you know, again, I think it's gonna be, um, I mean, human beings innovate, that's what we do. We, we, we have this call to, um, uh, min, whether it's minimalism or whatever, there's there's cultures that do this around um, the planet as well, but we're it's just hard, nobody had to teach us to innovate. It's hardwired in our DNA. Aborigines innovate. They, they may not collect as much stuff, but we see even these primordial tribes around the globe that are con in some areas are constantly innovating. How do I fish better? How do I, uh, you know, they may not be using tools of the industrial revolution, but they're, they're using a different hook or a different, using different material because it's hollower and stronger and f whatever. Mm -hmm. um, the cons what I hope back to wisdom, what I hope we get is how is it as we innovate, we realize we're all on this spaceship, this rock. And, and I think this transcends even whether it's a Western culture or Eastern culture <laughs> or um, humanist philosophy or religious philosophy. This is our yard that we have to work in. And to the degree that we consume the resources um, and are messy with them. Um, is to the degree that uh, we impact human flourishing, I think, negatively. Mm -hmm. So how do we get wiser with our, with our resources? How do we get r wiser with our time? How do we get wiser with this stuff? I don't know, we also tend to be lazy, so. Well, here's, it, it, here, here's another reason why I think that is too. There's, um, you know, innovation is creativity, right? Mm -hmm. Creativity is, is uh, you know, interesting rearrangements of found elements, right? We find new ways of putting different things together. So NASA did a study back in the 60s. They were looking for the most creative people in the world and trying to find how to build a pipeline to bring them to NASA. Mm -hmm. They did a study in uh, what they called um, divergent thinking, right? Is like being able to, <clears throat> like if I were to you know take a paperclip, it's a classic paperclip study, right? So you right. hold up a paperclip, Dave, how many uses of this paperclip can you give me in the next two minutes? Right. And the way the study broke down is like a kindergartner 
or would be able to give you a hundred uses right. for it. And a lot of the ideas would be crazy, but they'd be right. awesome. Right. So the, the 10 year old will only be able to give you 50. Right. And the 15 year old will only be able to give you 25. And you, unfortunately, Dave, since you're an adult, can only give two versions of that paperclip, according to this NASA study, right? right? And uh, that's an awareness of that. As adults, we become less creative, less entrenched, less um, willing to accept crazy ideas. That you know that limits us in a lot of ways. I yeah. think. I there is a there is a um, a speech I a speech I I watched. I didn't used to say that a long time ago. A speech I, I understand watched. the context now though. Um, well, he he is a British educator. It's a famous YouTube video, and he talks about the consequences of removing art from school, mm. from public school in particular. Sir, I know exactly who you're talking yeah. about. Yep, British guy. British guy. Yep. One of the most brilliant, at least I believe it was one of the most brilliant speeches because it's back to one of those things where, huh, I would never have thought about that. At the end of his talk, I don't even need to fact check it because it was so, when I reflect back on my own life or that of my kids, it's so tracks with what he was saying and the big idea was kind of what you're talking about take a kindergartner or whoever three-year-old set them down play-doh marker anything turn them loose and you don't have to stimulate their imagination and they're going to come up with these fantastical ideas it is in every human being we may have more or less talent to stay within the lines and then we make a judgment on whether that's wise or not wise but as opposed to just go, just create. It's not talent, it's access. Because we all have the ability to do it. Well, yeah. his point was, yeah. so then why are we removing this? He's not anti-STEM, he's not anti these other things. But of all the things that human beings, you know, how are we gonna solve um, the problems that come at us, it's probably gonna be with divergent thinking, so many of them. How are we gonna rethink or reimagine or relook or repurpose uh, something? Um, it's gonna be with that kind of a mindset and a few push through. But anyway, I thought that was a beautiful, amazing talk. Well, it's, it's, it's powerful and he's, he's so spot on and it's very aligned with this, uh, this study that was done. And uh, I'm going to look it up while we're talking. I got to find his name. Keep going. Yeah. And so I actually did a test with my, I think he was nine at the time, my nine year old at the time, we were stuck in the back backseat of a Tahoe on our way somewhere. And uh, there was a Sir little... Ken Robinson. Robinson. Yeah. That was it. I, I think yep. he's passed now, but Sir Ken Robinson. That's a, uh, yeah, that was a great talk. Just last year. So anyway, I was sitting in the back with, with Keller, who's, who's now 10, but uh -huh. I think he was eight or nine at the time and had a little plastic piece. And we went back and forth with this little plastic piece. I'm like, what do you think this is? And we came up with like 60 or 70 versions of what that thing could be based on my willingness to not care if I sounded stupid and his just brilliantly open mind. Right. right. So, uh, Bringing that back to data centers, to technology, um, you know, Pablo Picasso talked about the power of computers, but like what's important, I mean, it doesn't matter what the rocket ship can do, what the computer can do without a great question, right? Mm. So humans, like we have this innate curiosity that's sometimes masked through the, through the education system that our ability to generate those great questions is the same thing as generating uses for the paperclip. So if we cultivated our ability to ask a great question, like that's where it all comes from. And then you have the computer that can process and find the answer. That's why we type things into Google all the time. You know, they, they're not always great questions, but right. that's the mechanism. Hey, thank you for checking out part one of this podcast. Be sure to like, comment, share, and subscribe. And we'll see you next week for part two on the QTS experience.